Uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, myself, Gary Decker, Rich Dender, and a gentleman from California and one from Florida spent two weeks at a sister congregation, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Callaway, Florida. It's a suburb of Panama City, and uh, they were blessed with a campus that's 20 acres large. Fifteen of it are, no, say five and a half acres probably are trees. Hurricane Michael, five acres of trees. We uh, ended up cutting up 239 trees hauled 80 trailer loads of debris to the road. I say that to say this. This past Thursday, I was talking with their pastor, uh, Randall Eric, and I said, hey, today's our last day. I got to get home. I got to write a sermon. I got one day to write a sermon. And he had words of wisdom. Just give them Jesus. <laughs> well, I hope I do that every time I preach, but yeah, just give them Jesus. That's, that's a good thing. So the question is, where is Jesus in Mother's Day? So I'm going to try to find scriptural references to back up a 105-year-old holiday. First of all, a little history lesson. Mother's Day is celebrated once a year on the second Sunday in May, for those of you like me that can't keep up with it. The holiday is inspired by a British day in honor of mothers, and the idea was brought to America by a woman named Julia Ward Howell, but she brought it to America as a call for peace during the Civil War. I did not know that until this weekend. Her idea influenced Ann Jarvis, who in 1858 attempted to improve the living conditions and the, uh, uh, the conditions in the Appalachians. The Appalachian Mountains, you know how poor area that is. And she wanted to do it through what she called a mother's work day. So back and forth, a mother's work day to help people out. When Jarvis died in 1907, her daughter Anna tried to get this thing, and she started a crusade to make it a true memorial day for women. Uh, and it happened that in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson declared the first National Mother's Day. And it was really a day for American citizens to honor mothers who lost sons in the war. That was how it started out. Nine years later, the lady who got it cranked up, got it started, got it going, was sickened by what it had become. America had commercialized Mother's Day. Can you imagine us commercializing a holiday? I mean, you know, when, when Christmas goes out before Halloween, something's very wrong. Yeah, and we're good at though. We're good at commercializing things. Here's kind of what we do now. She became an opponent of it. She didn't like it at all. But today now, we're going to spend... Two and a half billion dollars on flowers. One and a half billion dollars on pampering gifts like a spa package. Don't see those on Father's Day. <laughs> 68 million on greeting cards. Yeah, I'm cheap. That's what I went with, greeting card, you know. Uh, and it didn't get here from Florida in time, so I'm like upset about that, but you know. <laughs> and we're going to spend three and a half billion dollars eating out today. I will not be in your way. I cannot stand the crowds like that. Now, oh, oh another thing. The jewelry industry. 10% of all jewelry is sold today for this day as gifts. 10% of the year's jewelry. Don't get me wrong. I think mothers are great. But uh, I think we should have this holiday every single day. We should honor our mothers. Instead of just trying to make up for how bad a son I was all year long on Mother's Day. I don't think the card's going to do it, but hey, it was cute, you know. <laughs> I don't like the commercialized part. I mean, we'd go broke if we tried to do this every day, every week for our moms. But I think the part of honoring our parents, honoring our mother, should be the part we try to make go for every day of the year. Live a life that makes your mother proud. I think that would be a great goal. I believe that we should honor mothers because God could have come to earth any way he wanted to. The incarnation could have, I mean, he could have just came in, come down on the cloud like he's going to come back the next time, you know, on a cloud, on a white steed or whatever. Could have come anyway. But he chose to come to earth. He chose to become flesh in the womb of a woman. True God, true man. When Mary, the expectant mother of Jesus, went to see her relative Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with the, the boy who would become John the baptizer, we read in, in Luke 1. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. 
And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then Mary responded with a song that we call the Magnificat. One of those lines from that song goes like this. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. God intended for all mothers to be a blessing. He intended for all women to be a blessing. He blessed the first Adam with a wife who became the mother of all that live. So what does it take to be called blessed? What kind of woman earns the title blessed? How high is the standard for a woman of God? Speaking of high standards, many years ago I was preaching the Father's Day sermon. And I thought it was a pretty good one. I mean, it was one of those that just really called the men to arms. Stand up and be an excellent man. Be a man of God. You know, reach for the stars as far as your fatherhood. Be a great husband. Oh, I thought it was good. After the service, Wayne Culpepper says, what's up with that sermon? What are you talking about? What's up with that sermon? I was kind of proud of it. He said, look, on Mother's Day, all the moms are pampered. They're <laughs> praised. You lift them up. You say how wonderful they are. And I feel like I've been called to the principal's office today. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So to be fair, today's Mother's Day message is a call to excellence for the women. First of all, we're going to look at Proverbs 31. <sighs> Why would you strive for excellence. Verse 10 says that an excellent wife, excellent woman, is far more precious than jewelry, more precious than rubies or diamonds or emeralds. That's what an excellent wife is, an excellent woman is. Verse 11 goes on to say that an excellent woman is trustworthy. Who here doesn't want to have full trust in their spouse? Your wife, your husband, even co worker Trust is a great thing to have. And an excellent woman is trustworthy. 13 says she's not lazy. She's a hard worker. 14 and 15 says she gets up before daylight. How many of us does that rule out? Gets up before daylight to have breakfast ready, to have food ready for the people, good meals for the family. Verse 16 says she's not just some demure housewife. She's a home management engineer, buying property, planting a vineyard. She's a shrewd businesswoman. Huh. Hadn't thought about a stay-at-home mom like that too often. She goes out and tells me she bought property. I'm going to go say what? <laughs> 17 and 18, she has strength of character and works long hours. 20 says she doesn't just care about her family. She's generous. She gives to the needy. She supports charities. She's probably the one that writes the tithe check at the church, you know. She plans ahead for hard times, according to 21 22. Saves up, puts her family in nice clothes. They're not dressed in rags. Verse 23 I thought was interesting. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. What, what exactly is that talking about? He's known. Well, here's what I think it means. Being known in the city gate means that the husband is getting credit for having an excellent wife. Everybody recognizes the woman behind the man is doing a really good job. I thought in common terms today, maybe it would be like this. Y'all see Pastor Dave walking down the street and somebody says, you wave to him. You know him? Who is that? Oh, that's Becky's husband. <laughs> I'd be Susan's husband, you know. That's an excellent wife when they are known and you're known because of your excellent wife. 28 says, an excellent woman gets respect from her children. Boy, wouldn't that be nice. <laughs> She gets respect from her husband. Her husband brags on her. He praises her. He does not talk down or be mean to her, right? An excellent woman doesn't depend on outward beauty. She doesn't need to charm and flatter you to get you to like her. She's got a golden heart. She's a woman who has a heart for God. And you can see it. And 31 basically says actions speak louder than words. Let her works praise her in the gates. All right, men. Have I raised the bar high enough for the ladies yet? 
No, not quite high enough. Let's go to the New Testament. I got one that all you married men are going to love, all right? St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 addresses a marital issue that's not covered in Proverbs 31. This is only going to apply to the married couples here, okay? Uh, now, you probably know that Paul was a confirmed bachelor. In his mind, he said, I think every man should be a monk, every woman should be a nun, nobody get married because you want to have all your time to focus on God, to focus on God. That's all your time should be. But I know that's not for everybody. So, if you are married, here's some advice. 1 Corinthians 7. Since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps for mutual consent for a time so that you could devote yourself to prayer. Then come back together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. All the men who fell asleep during the Proverbs part just woke up. <laughs> They're going right in the pencil. Give me a pencil. What was that? 1 Corinthians 7. All you married men, I expect an extra 20 in the plate when it comes by too for that one. <laughs> You're welcome. But before we men get too cocky, we've got to remember St. Paul's words in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. We are called to lay down our life for our wives, to sacrificially love the women in our lives, to be there for them no matter what, to stand beside them. Nobody says anything bad about my wife. I can't have it. You can't have it. You've got to love them enough to stand up for them. If we don't love our wives like this, we are disobeying a command of God. You may have heard it said, as goes the home, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes the world. Maybe this passage is where the idea came from. Christian marriage is a picture of Christ and his church to an unbelieving world. Secondly, if we fail to love our wives like this, we sin against our wives and we sin against our children because they watch how we treat our wives. Men and women, mothers and fathers, are called to a high standard of excellence. But how many of us really measure up to that? Scripture is not meant to discourage, but to inspire. Think about it this way. In football, only one team gets to the national championship, but all the teams try hard. They train. They play hard. They struggle. In the Olympics, only one runner gets the gold medal. That everyone trains to win. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 said, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. I like that. Run like you want the prize. But then again, look what he said in, in this next verse in Acts 20. My only aim, Paul says, <laughs> is just to finish the race. I think that's most of us. If we could just finish the race in faith, you know, maybe we're not all going to be number one, but if I could finish the race, here's what he says. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus gave me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. God is gracious and graceful. Jesus makes the good news plain in our lesson today. John 10, 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And here's, here's a great verse. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Even though we run like we want to win the race, getting the gold medal does not depend on how you place in the race. Seeing the streets of gold isn't dependent on me and how well I do. I may not be the best preacher in the world. I may not be the best pastor. I may not be the best husband. I may not be the best father. I may not be the best at anything. But my Savior was and is the best gift giver ever known to man. He gave his very life on the cross so that even though I don't measure up, it's okay. 
He uses the cross as a measuring stick, not my life. Proverbs 31 is not used to measure women, but to inspire women. Every scripture that challenges men and women to godliness is given not to intimidate, but to invigorate our faith. The bloodstained cross and the empty tomb are our motivation for holy living. The resurrected Christ is our victory because he is risen. We too shall rise. John wrote, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Paul wrote, thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our victory isn't based on how we give it our all, but how Christ gave his all. Our victory isn't based on how we impress but on Christ in his distress on the cross. Our victory isn't based on how we get what we deserve, but how Christ gives us what we don't deserve. So let me encourage all you moms out there this morning. God doesn't call you to be perfect. He calls you to walk in his perfection. It's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, declares the Lord. I'm going to close with this illustration. See if you can find yourself or maybe find Jesus in this one. It was about a mom who's in the kitchen cooking dinner, getting things ready, and a little boy comes in, I don't know, eight or nine years old. And he comes up to her and she sees he's got a little piece of paper in his hand. And it's got a bunch of scribbling on it. He's been harking on this little piece of paper for quite a while. He hands it to her. She wipes off her hands on her aprons, takes the piece of paper, and starts to read it. Here's what it says from her little son For mowing grass, you owe me $5. <laughs> For making my own bed this week, one dollar. For going to the store for you, 50 cents. For playing with my baby brother while you went shopping, only 25 cents. For taking out the trash, a dollar. For getting a good report card, five dollars. For raking the yard, two dollars. Mom looked at him, she thought about it for a minute. She got her pencil, turned it over, started writing on the back. For nine months I caged you, growing inside me. No charge. For the nights I sat up with you, doctored you, prayed for you. No charge. For the time and the tears and the cost through the years. No charge. For the nights filled with dread and the worries ahead. No charge. For advice and knowledge and the cost of your college. No charge. For the toys, food, and clothes and for wiping your nose. No charge. Son, when you add it all up, the full cost of my love is no charge. When the son had finished reading this, he had big old tears in his eyes. He looked up and said, Mama, I sure do love you. And he took the pencil back and he wrote on his side, paid in full. In this illustration, we're the little boy when we think we've done really good. We think we've been great Christians this week. But see, Jesus is the mama who looks at us and sees our hidden sin and he says, forgiveness, no charge. Then Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and he says, paid in full full. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this day we're so grateful for the gift of grace, for forgiveness, for your son given for us. May we be half the man, half the father, half the mother that we're supposed to be. In Christ's name, amen.